in recent years, since I began reporting in Israel 2010, you have a sharp rise in the level of incitement from top political officials and top religious officials, incitement to racism. You have hundreds of chief rabbis that are paid by the government, paid by my tax money, inciting racism, calling upon all Jews not to sell or even rent apartments to non-Jews, if you can imagine that. Afterwards, they were not removed from office or punished in any way, just the opposite. Their budgets were actually increased. Okay, and these, these attacks, these verbal attacks on the non-Jewish population of the country, it's not just in the air. These have effects. People hear them and they take them to heart. And so you have in recent years an upswing in the amount of attacks on Palestinian citizens of Israel, on Palestinians in the West Bank, on other non-Jews like African refugees. And some of these attacks take the form of graffiti attacks, attacks on property, writing racist messages. And it's not just in the West Bank, it's all across the country, even in Tel Aviv now. And some of these attacks aren't just property damage, they're actual physical attacks on people. And when you have these physical attacks on people, then we have impunity. For the example, the case of Jamal Julani, who was attacked on uh, a downtown Jerusalem in the summer of 2012. And his attackers, after they beat him, they were just looking for any Arab to attack. After they beat him to death, he was later resuscitated by paramedics. While they were resuscitating him, his attackers just stood there. And they said, why are you resuscitating him? What do you care? He's an Arab. Let him die. They didn't run away. They weren't afraid. They needn't have been afraid because they knew that the full weight of the law would not fall upon them. And in fact, they were right. When they were eventually arrested, police interrogated them and they admitted it. They weren't ashamed. Yeah, we attacked this Arab because he's Arab. And even though their confessions were videotaped, the police say they lost those tapes. Mm -hmm. So in the end, they served just maybe a couple months for practically killing a man. So this is the level of impunity. And it's not just me saying this. You have even Karmi Gilon, the former head of the Shin Bet. And you have Shabtai Shavit, the former head of the Mossad, saying the exact same thing. That although Israel is a nation of laws and has anti-hate crimes on the books, it does not enforce these laws. So there is a culture of impunity. And even when you have liberal legislators trying to instill values of tolerance, trying to combat this wave of hate. You have an effort to legislate just one hour a week of anti-racist education in the schools. The entire government voted against it, shut it down. So even that little measure couldn't pass. And so that's the prelude. And then this summer, it just goes over the top and you have Israelis as soon as they learn that these three Israeli teenagers have been kidnapped, you have an outpouring of hate, especially on the internet. You have people uploading pictures of themselves, memes to Facebook, pictures of themselves saying, attack Palestinians, attack Palestinians, attack Arabs, kill the Arabs. And you have people putting up photos of themselves with their own names, connected to their own Facebook accounts without shame, calling for attacks. I'm talking about people putting up signs saying, revenge of the Jews. Hating Arabs is not val racism, it's values. The people demand revenge. And then when they find the bodies of these boys, then the politicians join in and they too call for revenge. And they call for attacks on Palestinians. And you have the head of a religious seminary praising a Jew who threw a grenade onto a bus full of Palestinians inciting people to do the same. You have Ayelet Shaked, the whip of the Jewish home faction of the government, saying, who is the enemy? The Palestinian, the Palestinian people are all enemy combatants. This also includes the mothers. And you have death to Arabs rallies. You have in Jerusalem, in Haifa, in Tel Aviv, in Be'er Sheva, in, in uh, Pardes Khana, in Nazareth. You have dozens and hundreds of Israelis marching through the streets, screaming, death to Arabs, Mabit la Aravim. And the police don't stop this. Maybe they'll 
try to curtail it, but it just keeps on and keeps on and keeps on. And then what happens when they find the bodies? Does Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, does he call for calm? Does he call for justice, which would have been legitimate? No. He calls for vengeance. He publicly calls for vengeance. And he lit the spark that burned Muhammad Abu Khader to death. Palestinian boy standing outside his parents' home. Israelis came, kidnapped him, beat him, poured gasoline down his throat, and lit him on fire, burned him to death from the inside out. Now, of course, there were some Israelis, many Israelis, who were horrified by this act. But there were others who were exhilarated by it. You have people on the internet writing, it's no shame to burn an Arab, it's a good deed to burn Arabs. A young Arab's body was found charred in a Jerusalem forest. I want to marry whoever did it. Again, this is under people's own names. There's no shame around expressing racism like this in Israel. Any simple Twitter search will show this to you. And yes, you had a government minister make a condolence call, and incidentally a government minister that was just fired yesterday, but he made a condolence call to the family of, the, the, of Abu Khder to express his sorrow. And just for making a condolence call, for expressing his sorrow, then you have people going on the internet calling for him to be murdered and for his family to be murdered. And so Netanyahu unleashes the hounds, releases the army onto West Bank and onto Gaza, and you saw what happened this summer, Max will speak about that. But while this is happening in Israel, you have chief rabbis, again paid by my tax money, calling this a holy war, a milchemet mitzvah, commanded by God. You have state-sponsored rabbis saying that the Israelis are allowed to take steps to exterminate the enemy. You have the deputy speaker of the Knesset, the head of the Jewish leadership faction of the ruling Likud party, Moshe Feiglin, saying that the civilian population of Gaza will be concentrated and subsequently to their elimination, Gaza will become part of Israel and will be populated by Jews. Open calls for ethnic cleansing. No shame. From the highest levels of government. You have Naftali Bennett, the head of the Jewish Home Party of the government, the economics minister. I've killed many Arabs in my life and there's no problem with that, he says openly. And during the war he says Hamas is conducting massive self-genocide. So he's attributing blame for the violence to Hamas, but he's calling it a genocide. When soldiers are preparing the mortars that they're going to launch onto Gaza, you have them writing messages on them. And some of them are so silly and sick, showing the lightness, the unbearable lightness with which people treat the carnage. Writing, this is for the cancellation of the Backstreet Boys concert, you scum. So, so that's, that's the, the aggrieved people. They feel aggrieved. We lost these you know, boy, boy band concerts. But there are other messages that are maybe even sicker when they have people writing, I'm sending this mortar in your name. Everyone focus on, completely wipe out any vestige of Amalek. And when you hear that word Amalek, that's not meant for your ears. That's meant for the ears of other Israeli Jews who understand Hebrew and have a grounding in the Bible, in the Torah. And that's a code word. That's a dog whistle. It means to genocide. To break out for one second. In the Bible, this people spoken about, the Amalek, whether they existed or didn't exist is a matter for archaeologists to, to, to debate. But the point is, according to the biblical narrative, these Amalek people are supposed to be so evil and so despised, according to the narrative, that Yahweh, God, instructs the Jewish people to genocide them, to kill every single one of them, men, women, children. And in fact, according to the biblical narrative, when there are kings of Israel who do not carry out a complete genocide, and they only kill the men and not the women, or, or the women, women and children, but not the cattle. They don't kill the cattle. And that's not enough. These prophets chastise these kings, saying, you are not following God's wishes. You didn't fully genocide them. This is in the Bible. So, it's not just left as some you know, historical or mythological event. That would be bad enough, but it's trotted out every few years, and it's like a, a, a roving tag labeled slapped onto any group of people that becomes the new rival, the new enemy of the Jewish people. So now, 
the Palestinian people are being called Amalek. The Palestinian people are being are say, it's, it, these people are saying, when I say these people, I'm talking about top Israeli leaders, and I'm talking about ra average Israeli citizens as well, calling Palestinians Amalek, saying that they should be genocided. You have top academics recommended by the Israeli government, like Mordechai Kedar of Bar Ilan University, saying the only thing that deters a suicide bomber is if he knows that his sister will be raped. And this message isn't just up in the air as, as, as some kind of philosophy. During the conflict, there were Palestinian militants who were captured by Israeli soldiers, brought back to Israel, tortured, and they claimed that they were threatened that their moms and their sisters would be raped. You have Arya King, who is a city councilor of Jerusalem, at that time responsible for security in the city of Jerusalem. And what does he say? What does he tell? a crowd of uh, Jewish Israelis assembled in front of him. The Rebbe expects us to act like Phineas, to commit acts of Phineas. Again, another biblical reference, not meant for your ears, meant for other Israeli Jews who are religious and who abide by the rules of the Torah. When they say Phineas or Pinchas, they're talking about a story in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, a religious zealot who, upon learning that there were Israelites who had romantic relationships with non-Israelite women, he went, he got so incensed by this Rasenschande that he took a spear and he pierced both of them. He murdered a couple, a, a man and a woman who were in the middle of coitus, in the middle of lovemaking, and he murdered them both because he was so incensed by this Rasenschande. And you have these Jewish Israeli leaders holding this religious zealot, this murderer up as an example of how to act. Commit acts of Phineas. The Rebbe wants us to commit acts of Phineas. The next night, those Israeli Jews went out, kidnapped Muhammad Abu Khder, burnt him to death, and when the police caught them, and they asked them why, they said, we were inspired by the story of Phineas. It's because of that story that we went out and killed him. These words aren't just up in the air. They have effects, murderous effects. This summer... As an example, while the conflict was going on, there are people who break out of the boundaries that the government and the religious leaders want to put people in. Even though you can't get married in Israel unless you're of the same religion, because marriage is controlled by religious officials, despite this, some people get past the state-sponsored efforts to separate them, and there was a couple that decided they want to spend their lives together. He, was, he is the son of Muslims, citizens of Israel, and she is the daughter of Jewish citizens of Israel. And they met and they fell in love, and they decided to spend their lives together. On the day they, they decided to celebrate their love, you had hundreds of Israeli Jews outside their wedding, protesting their wedding, screaming, death to Arabs, death to Arabs. And these people, this group, gets money from the government through their sister organization. They are state-sponsored. This is the group called Lehava. Okay? And sadly, this isn't a new phenomenon. It goes back decades, and it goes back even further. But you have this group, Lehava, organizing death to Arabs rallies on the streets, organizing anti-miscegenation or anti rassenschande rallies across Israel whenever they learn of a wedding and so-called intermarriage. And at the wedding, when they were asked for comment, the spokesperson of the group told Ma'ariv newspaper, saying, Hitler was right, but about the wrong nation. We are the chosen race. This is the discourse in Israel today, that you're not told in your media, that you're not told by your leaders. Why is that? Why do I have to fly here from Tel Aviv, waste fossil fuels to come here to tell you this? And it's not only the far right, it's not only the extremists. Yes, it's true, the leaders of this anti-miscegenation group are far right. And they call these intermarriages the continuation of the gas chambers. How disgusting. Two people deciding to spend their lives together, two people in love with each other. They say that's the gas chambers, that's the annihilation of the Jewish people. What a disgusting perversion of the Holocaust. You even have a deputy minister in the government saying that intermarriages are a silent holocaust. But you also have centrist politicians from the so-called 
centrist Yesh Atid party saying, also hitting on the same tropes, saying that the Arabs, yes, I'll name them by names. You have Miki Levi from the centrist Yesh Atid party saying, the Arabs of East Jerusalem threaten us by hitting on our daughters, by flirting with our daughters. And you have Yair Lapid, the leader of the so-called centrist Yesh Atid party, saying, oh, if my son came to me and said that he wanted to be with a non-Jewish woman, it would bother me greatly. What's it your business what people do in their bedrooms? Why are you trying to stop people from loving each other? Why are you trying to separate the so-called races and religions? This is a secular democracy? I'm not going to speak for much longer because I want to be respectful of the time and I want Max to be able to tell you about what actually happened in Gaza while this was going on in Israel. But just let me say a couple words about the media in Israel. Yes, they are reporting these same things you don't hear about, but in the op-ed pages you have articles talking about in Yediot Achonot, in Gaza there is no such thing as innocent civilians. If you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those whom you leave will become pins in your eyes. You have to drive them all out if they're not Jewish. Return Gaza to the Stone Age in Israel Hayom. In the Jerusalem Post, solution requires the relocation of the Arab population and Israeli sovereignty. Calling Palestinians in op-eds subhuman creatures, hulking humanoid troglodytes, modern-day Morlocks, savages, the wild beast. And you have in the Times of Israel, published by Seth Klarman, you have an op-ed piece saying, when genocide is permissible. That was the title of the blog. Now, admittedly, there was such a furor over this that they immediately, within a few hours, removed that saying the only way to achieve Israel's goal of sustaining quiet is through genocide. They did remove that. But they left an article that was published the exact same day that called for the exact same thing. Another article that said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, fight against them until they are exterminated. That article was left up on the site because it used only coded language, so you wouldn't know that they were calling for genocide. This is openly published in the Israeli discourse. Where are you? Yes, there are journalists, like you mentioned, my former colleague Gidon Levy, who do speak up, who do question the official narrative of the government. And for that, he gets death threats. And even so-called liberal rabbis, like Gideon Sylvester, suggest that maybe he is a traitor, maybe he is a snitch, a moser. And traditionally, that means that he should be mutilated or murdered. Okay? So this is the discourse. Even anyone who's a dissident gets death threats. You have even the so-called Justice Minister of Israel, Sipi Livni, saying on her Facebook, she saw a horrible poster. It says, Free Palestine. I managed to tear part of the poster. She's on vacation. She sees a poster. She rips it down. She's giving a message to Israelis on the street. When those few Israelis are protesting against the war, she encourages people to attack them by talking about how she ripped down the poster. Now the message is, you should rip down their posters. And that's exactly what happened. When those few Jewish Israelis who had the courage to protest against the war, and not only Jewish Israelis, of course, Palestinian citizens of Israel were also protesting. And they got arrested, over a thousand of them, just for protesting against the war. And when you have these people protesting, you have fascist gangs in the streets beating them, taking chairs, smashing them over the heads, police standing by doing nothing about it. You have even the deputy mayor of Haifa going to a protest, an anti-war protest, and you have fascist gangs coming up and beating him, and he says that the police were there and they saw it and they did nothing. This is the deputy mayor of Haifa. This is the discourse in Israel today, and this is how the few people who reject the discourse are treated. Polls conducted showed that 95% of the Jewish Israeli population of Israel said that the operation was justified. Only 3% of Jewish Israelis felt that excessive firepower was used. And what about the next generation? What about the youth? The education minister tells students at the end of the war, the lesson from the war 
is to be Jewish fighters. You have the head of the largest Jewish religious youth group in the world, the head of Bnei Akiva, Noam Pearl, writing, turn the army into an army of avengers. Don't just kill 300 Palestinians, but scalp their penises and bring back their foreskins as war trophies. He kept his job. He's still the head of Bnei Akiva. And he's affiliated with the Jewish Home Party in the mm. government. Now, what about the ruling Likud Party and their affiliated youth group, Beitar? Well, this year, you know how they celebrated Holocaust Remembrance Day? Yom HaShoah? How they remembered the Holocaust? When they should have been remembering never again, never again a genocide, what did they do? They protested at the German embassy in Tel Aviv and said, remember what Amalek did to you. We will build a Jewish state that has no need for European morality. On the day that we should be saying never again to a genocide, he's calling for a genocide. Remember what Amalek did to you. That's y'all. Now the Germans are Amalek and now the Germans deserve to be genocided. This is the, uh, the leader of the official youth group affiliated with the ruling party in Israel, with the Likud party. Why don't you know about this? Even when Holocaust survivors write an article in the newspaper, and they, sorry, it wasn't an article, they took out a half-page advertisement in newspapers talking about that they completely reject, they completely unequivocally condemn the massacre of Palestinians in Gaza. You have Israelis coming on the internet saying, Holocaust survivors who think like this are invited to go die in the gas chambers. All right. I'm going to conclude now with the final piece that I wanted to share with you. Probably the most disgusting thing that I can tell you. Unfortunately, it's sad, but I have no choice but to share it with you. Three years ago, on Yom HaShoah, talking about Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, since we are on the anniversary of Kristallnacht, you have Israeli high school students from around the Tel Aviv area brought to the Kamari, the National Theater of Israel, to see a presentation of Ghetto, a play about the Holocaust. And while the play is ongoing, you have students in the audience, while on stage you have actors playing Nazis beating the actors who are playing Jews in the play. And while this is going on, you have students in the audience saying, yeah, get them, beat them, get them, encouraging the actor playing a Nazi to beat the actor playing a Jew. It got to the point where the entire cast broke down in tears. And after the, the actor got up and said, it was telling the crowd, it was disgraceful, your behavior. You embarrassed the Jewish people in the Holocaust. How is this possible that Israeli Jewish students who learn from infancy, nowadays, even in kindergarten, they learn about the Holocaust, if you can imagine that. How is it possible that their entire lives they've been told this story again and again, yet they ha still, some of them at least, can have no respect for what happened? It's because of how it's taught. It's not taught never again for anyone. It's taught never again just for us. We have to be strong and forget about everyone else. And that's why when Israeli students are polled, Jewish Israeli students, after getting Holocaust education, 92% of them says, yes, I've seen racism towards foreigners, but only 2% say that they identify with the suffering of persecuted nations. And only 2% say that they feel a commitment to preserve democracy. This is the next generation because they're being programmed by the government to use the story of the Holocaust not as a universal lesson to ne that no people deserve to be genocided, that no minorities deserve to be persecuted. The only lesson they're being taught is that they need to be strong, they need to be powerful, and screw everyone else. And unless people stop in, step in and decry this, it's going to continue and it's going to get even worse. And you of all people, the people in this room, have a special responsibility because it's this narrative that in which our peoples are intertwined that is being used to fuel these genocidal impulses and these perversions of history.